So today I want to talk about um, big jobs, sort of large computational tasks and computer simulations, which are challenging for reproducibility of a project. I think um, maybe, you know, any data analysis project, there's some challenges to ensure that the results are going to be reproducible, you know, that you've organized things so that the code and data could be handed over to someone else to be rerun. Um, when the when the data analysis work, when the computations take a long time, say a week of computation time or a year of computation time, um, maybe compressed into a shorter period of real time by using many different CPUs. Um, it, you know, in those cases, it will be hard to re for others to reproduce it um, because you know, first they just will have to throw a lot more computation and wait a lot longer for the results to be done. But secondly, they'll, um, it, it tends to be that for parallel computing jobs that the, um, the computing setups is somewhat specific to, you know, different, um, well, I mean, each of our computing setups for parallel computing can be quite different and reproducing the, res the work somewhere else can, can be difficult. Um, computer simulations seem sort of inherently difficult to reproduce, um, but those are the, the two main issues I'm talking about today. Uh, but first, I just wanted to uh, sort of synthesize our thoughts about um, the, the, the reproducibility things we've been talking about the last couple of weeks and ask, um, you know, suppose I just written up an R function and it seems to be working fine, but I, I have an idea of how to speed it up um, to make my R function faster and better than what I have written. Before I start hacking into it to speed it up, what should I do first? I have an idea. Um, yes. I think you should commit it to Git first, so that if you mess something up, you can just go back to your or original implementation. Very good, exactly. Um, for sure, the first thing to do is put it in a Git repository and commit what you have. Um, is it, if, if <laughs> it's often the case that the, um, you start hacking away at it and you, um, it, it, the idea that seemed really awesome 30 minutes ago no longer seems to be very awesome anymore. And it, uh, you want to be able to go back to the previous state. So I would also add, put it into an R package. You know, if the R function is important enough for you to want to try to optimize it in some way, then it'd be, it would be good to put it in the context of an R package. Um, you know, if you're writing Python, it's a Python function, then I think, you know, make it a formal Python module by, you know, adding a bit of documentation. And then further write a test or two. Um, the, having having the, the function within an R package, having some tests that show that it works will help to guide you when you're working on trying to optimize the function of is it still working properly or not. Um, having a couple tests that really then show when you've done your optimization, it really is faster. Is it still giving the same answers? But for sure the, you know, step number one, commit it to a Git repository so that when you're hacking away starts to go bad that you can get back to the state it was in a half an hour or an hour before when you were confident that it was really working but having some tests that um where where you can see these tests work before and they still work now that gives you better confidence that you've not only sped it up but you're still getting the same answers anyway back to the big jobs situation um or you know computer simulations within a data analysis project uh, the you know the the 
the deal is really that um, you don't you don't want to have to have your R Markdown document take a year to compile or even 15 minutes to compile. And you don't have you don't want to have to rerun things if you don't have to. If you're you know editing some text in a document, you don't want to have to go through and also rerun all the analyses every time you make some you know correct some typos in the text describing the analysis. Um, in, in many cases, you'll want to just pull the compu you know the heavy computational tasks out of your your R markdown or you know your your main report into a, a separate file and you'll if if something's going to take an hour to run um, you probably want it running in the background you don't want to lock up your R studio or other IDE um, so we I talked about this briefly before but um, Sort of the main function for main way to put R stuff running in the background is you know you have some R script that you're going to run and you use R command batch to run it um, sort of in batch mode rather than interactive mode and in Unix in Mac in Windows you can you put an ampersand at the end of the line to have it run in the background. And in, in many cases on a Unix system, you want to use this other function, nice, um, so other program command, nice, to give the thing lower priority, so that um, you know if it's running for an hour, that it's not taking up the heaviest. Or it's not viewed by the computer as having high priority to running, um, you know, where it's you know really. Um, you know, your YouTube video in Chrome that you want to, you don't want your R command to be slowing down the YouTube videos that you're watching. Um, sort of a second thing is sort of how to bring it, bring that background command um, back into the foreground or, or suspend it. So FG um, will bring this thing back into the foreground so that you can then cancel it if you want, or you could suspend it again with control Z and you could put it back into the background with BG. Um, I use PS UX to get a list of all the jobs that are running. And I might use grep on the output to focus on, you know, our jobs or particular jobs that I'm running. Um, and I use top will give it is a command to give an overview of what's going on. I think the the main thing I use those for is to see kind of how much memory different jobs are taking. It's sometimes hard to predict how memory intensive your R ca your calculations in R are going to take, and when if they if they start to take up all the memory in your system, they're really going to um, clog everything up and it, something that should take an hour will end up taking, you know, basically infinite amount of time. It, your computer would just never really be able to finish it. Um, if you see that the thing is starting to, your computer is sluggish because the, the thing is used, has used up all the memory and it's starting to go back and forth to disk, um, kill and kill minus nine are, are you know, commands you can use to kill off a specific job. You need to give it a, a process ID there. At, you say kill and then a, name, a particular process ID that you learn from these two out, the output of those two commands. Um, my, the minus nine somehow means like I really want to kill this job. If it tends to not want to be killed, then kill minus nine is like super kill. Um, P kill is sort of a, a kill, it, instead of having to give a, a specific process ID, you can give kind of a, 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 a pattern. So you can kill all the jobs that are, all of the R jobs at once with this, if you want, it's worth looking into. Um, but when, I mean, when you, it, all of us data scientists at some point start to have some computations that take a lot of time. 
um, you probably want to pull those out of your main, um, re, you know, main report analysis a, as a s separate script, and probably want to be running those in the backgrounds. And these are the, some of the the Unix um, commands that I use to to manage those things. And I would say that the the main challenge that I have is disk crashing of you know if a job starts to take too much memory of having um get, getting to this disk thrashing state <laughs> wikipedia the Wiki, there's a wikipedia article at disk about disk thrashing that has this this is their definition of disk thrashing which i find really amusing because it's just um yeah, in computer science, thrashing occurs when a computer's virtual memory subsystem is in a constant state of paging. This is like a definition that somehow makes it harder to understand. Uh, but they, they do go on to say uh, rapidly exchanging data in memory for data on disk to the exclusion of most application level processing. It's basically like if you have four gigs of RAM on your laptop, and you're running a job that needs to use six gigs of RAM, uh, or or it needs all four gigs of, grant, of RAM, but you have other processes running like iTunes and Chrome, um, the computer will will take the processes that are take some of the processes and sort of and write the RAM information to disk to make space for your other um, process that's that needs to be running. Um, but it'll, um, if a given job goes beyond how much RAM you have, then it will be saving some stuff to disk and reading some stuff off of disk and doing that back and forth over and over, sort of bringing everything to a halt. Um, and, um, and, this this is the thing. This if if your job that uses more memory than you have available on your computer, this is sort of this is why it will um, bring your computer to a halt and not get the work done. And so you want to, you want to anticipate this because once once this starts happening, it's really hard to even log into the computer to get it to do anything to cancel the job. Um, so you want to pay attention to how much run some initial tests, say, to see how much memory jobs are going to take, especially if you're running um, several of them all at once. It, if you, if you do, the jobs that you're running are not hugely long, you know, it's just a few minutes, you might want to just leave them in your R Markdown document and not pull them out. Um, but you might want to cache the results so that they only get run when they need to get run. So um, there are different ways to do this, of you know, dealing with biggest jobs in Knitter. Um, you can sort of manually cache the results, or you can use um, kind of the built-in caching that that Knitter and R Markdown have, and you can use cache equals true for a code chunk. Um, and I'll, I'll show in a moment some examples of that. Or kind of as I said before, you can just split the work out as a separate file and write a make file that will, will sort of automate them. Manual caching is kind of roll your own, um, cache the results um, so that they only get run when you, when you need them to. So say I have um, a bunch of code that's going to take five minutes to run. I really only want to run it once. Um, so I could have in, a, in an R code, in R markdown, um, I'm going to save the results to a file. And, you know, so first I have an if statement that says, if this file exists, then just load it. Otherwise, you know, run the, the five minutes of, of calculations and then save it to a file. So this code chunk, if 
the previous results have already, if the results have already been obtained, it just loads it and zips over this, you know, it just takes the time to load the results from file. Um, if the previous results haven't been done yet, if that file doesn't exist, then it does the calculations and then saves it to that file. Um, so this is just so that you only run this when you have to. Um, it's, you know, completely manual so that if you decide that you need to really run this because some other parts of the analysis have changed that you really need to run this again then you just you would have to delete that file you'd have to know i'm going to delete this file so that this thing gets rerun and you could go through and you know if you have all the caches in this some cache directory you could just if you want to get a fresh start delete all the files in there and run everything you know it takes a while but um, get the results that you know are correct and true. I should mention, um, in, in addition to sort of the load and save uh, functions in R, there are these read RDS and save RDS files that if you're saving single objects to a file, I like these, because it, it doesn't save the name of the object, so you, you and it doesn't save the name of the object, so you create the objects, um, th which gives you some greater flexibility, I think. So if if my hefty calculations are just going to create one object that I want to save, then I would, you know, this manual caching, um, create a, you know, check to see if the thing has already been done. If so, read it in that file. If not, do the hefty calculations and then save it to a file. If there are a bunch of objects I'm going to save, I'm going to do this version with the, the load and the save. Um, if there's just a single object, I go with this read RDS and save RDS that doesn't save the object names and so gives me a bit more filling. Um, the, the, well, the, I mean, the problem with the manual caching, the main problem with manual caching is that it, it's completely up to you to delete that intermediate file, um, when it needs to get rerun. And the a second problem with the manual caching is that, the, you know, this whole chunk of if else code is really pretty ugly and you may not want to show your if you're showing the reader of your r markdown report some code you they probably don't want to see all this ugliness um but a, a way to get around that is is to use chunk references so um so i have I have a, an initial chunk that has all the code that's going to be run, um, but show, but has a val equals false. So this this code chunk, I would put, you know, where I have this, you know, code here equals zero. Where I have that, I have, you know, my five minutes worth of calculations to be done. But I have a val equals false, so it doesn't get run. And then in the second code chunk, I do this. Um, manual caching of a, create a file name to save the results. If that exists, I just load the file and do nothing else. If it doesn't exist, then I this thing right here refers back to that previous code chunk. It's as if I typed all this code that I put here right down here. So less than less than sign the name of the code chunk greater than greater than sign. And then after that stuff gets done, I save the key. I save the key findings to a file. So this manual caching has the advantage that I can just, you know, do it directly myself. Um, I'm going to pick off what are the thing, you know, what are the things I want to save. I'm going to define those myself and save them to a file after I've run the code. Um, and then I add this little, if the file exists, just load it. If the file doesn't exist, then run all the code and then save it to a file. 
And if I feel like I need to rerun that code, I just delete that file. I delete all the files in my cache directory and then all these code, code chunks will get rerun. This chunk references business here. The whole idea is that what the, what the user reading my report sees is um, just the code as if I wasn't doing any caching. They'll see this code, but it doesn't get evaluated. What actually gets run, this, this code chunk doesn't get shown, but it does get run and it refers back to the code in, the, in that previous non-run chunk. Um, so this saves, the, I mean, the, the advantage of this is hiding the caching system to your user, but um, the chunk references mean that I don't have to, I don't have to have copies of the code. I don't have to have two copies of the code. I just have the one copy. So I know for sure that these bits of code will be exactly the same. So um, I, I had written this book, QTL, um, a guide to QTL mapping um, 15 years ago now, something like that. Um, it was well before R Markdown, well before Knitter, using a previous system called S-Weave. Um, and I, so I had used this manual caching system to, in order to do that. And this picture is um, directly from the published copy of the book. And really the first time I saw the book in print, I sort of flipped through it and I saw this picture immediately. Um, and this is a, a cache that's gone bad. So the figure here, it's, it's supposed to be that the red curve the red curve is supposed to be about here and the black curve is supposed to be about here. Uh, but I had changed something in the code so that, and, but I hadn't changed my cache of the results of this in this figure so that the figure was corrupted because it was doing the wrong thing. Um, if I had deleted, and it was because of this manual caching that the cache should have been deleted and, you know, sort of refreshed and it, it wasn't, and the copy editor didn't notice this, and I didn't notice this, and my co-author didn't notice this. It, it, we didn't notice this until the thing has actually been printed a bunch of copies. Um, well, all the copies that would ever be printed. <laughs> so my scheme for manual caching is, um, gives you full control over what you're saving, and um, but can lead to results like this. You know, they, you know, they say, um, there are only two hard problems in computer science that, um, cache and validation and naming things. Um, this is the cache and validation thing here of realizing that the cache is no longer valid and needs to be re reconstructed. That I, I think, yeah, it's, um, it's a problem. So, so I shouldn't really, I shouldn't have even mentioned that manual caching system. Other than that, I still use it because it's just like easy. Um, and it gives you control over what you're saving. Um, it's better probably to use the, the built-in caching system for Knitter. So our markdown... Um, in a code chunk, if you write if you write if you write cache equals true, it will automatically figure out what needs to be cached here. So if you have a code chunk that reads in a big data file and then um, takes the the median of every column. If you if you use cache equals true, it will it will run this the first time and then figure out what it is in this thing that needs to be calculated and save it to a file for you. And then in subsequent runs, it will skip over that and just read in this the meet the set of medians um, from its cache. If I edit if I edit this ch code chunk at all it will um, keep track of that and re and so 
when it gets to this code chunk, it somehow compares this to the, you know, the code chunk that was run for the saved cache and it will um, rerun it only if it, if it notices that you made some changes to the, to the code. Otherwise it'll just read in the results. Um, so this is like um, my manual caching system, except fully automatic. It decides what it's going to save to a file, and it, it, it you leave it to the you leave it to Knitter to figure out have you made any changes to this code that lead it to want to be rerun, or or not. Um, So I, I rec this is probably the, the recommended way to do caching with R Markdown and Knitter. I find that it's a bit, it, it tends to rerun things even though I don't really feel like they need to be rerun. Um, but better to do that than to not run it when it was, when it was supposed to. But things that have side effects that you should never use this cache, and that's particularly graphics. Um, and, or it, you know, setting various options or setting graphic graphical options, um, any kinds of any any code that's producing side effects, which are things that are outside the code, you know, setting global variables or something like that, um, you should not um, you should not cache them. So calculations that you're doing that create that create objects, those you can cache, and then um, you would make a separate code chunk that's doing any graphs, and those things you would not cache. But a, a challenge here is about dependencies, um, and so you 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 can tell Knitter that um, if a particular code chunk, the results or you know the analysis in one particular code chunk depends on results that were were derived from some other code chunk, you can tell it about that. So if you know, so here I'm caching um, three different code chunks, and I'm saying code chunk B depends on the results of code chunk A, and code chunk C depends on the results of code chunk B. So then if if code chunk B gets rerun, code chunk C would also get rerun because of that dependency. Or if code chunk A gets rerun, then chunk B and chunk C will also get rerun. But it, you know, after after all these things are run, if there's if none of the code is edited, it should be just rather than running these things, um, just reading in the results from disk. Um, you, if the code for if the if the code in a code chunk doesn't take much time at all, if it's taking less than a second, you probably don't want to cache it. You only want to cache things that are that are taking enough time that it's sort of um, painful you for you to wait um, while the thing is being built. And here, I this is just totally fake set of code, um, and I'm using this sys.sleep equals sys.sleep2, that just um, puts R to sleep for two seconds. And that's just, um, y if you were to put this into an R, um, R markdown document and run it, you, the, the sys.sleep would, would make it so that you could, you could watch it, um, could watch what it's doing. Maybe I should try this out. Um, let me. So if I if I go to our studio, um, I'm going to. Create a new R Markdown document. Uh, 
Uh, the first thing I do is delete everything. But let me let me just um, I guess copy that code that I did there. If I can find it. There. Um, I have three code chunks that aren't really doing anything interesting, but let me save them to a file. Um, test caching. So if I run this, if I knit this, this file, um, you can see that it, it waits a couple seconds as it runs chunk A, chunk B, chunk C. And that just makes it so that I can really see that they got run. Now, if I if I edit chunk B slightly um, and run this again, we should see that it zipped over chunk A super fast and ran chunk B again. Um, and it didn't seem like it ran chunk C the way that I would think. Let's see. So if I edit, it should be that if I edit chunk chunk B, and I run this, that it'll run. It'll not run chunk A, but it'll run chunk B and C. But it doesn't seem to be working the way I would I expected it to. I wonder if it's these spaces. Okay, that seemed to work if you saw. So I added this, you know, sys.sleep here, and I added this sys, these sys.sleeps just so that in this R markdown console down here, you could see um, it would pause there long enough that you could see it was running chunk B and then running chunk C. Um, so it should be if I edit chunk A, then all three things get run. If I edit chunk B, then B and C get run. If I edit chunk C, then just C gets run. It'll zip past A and B and just go to chunk C. That seems to work. Um, it wasn't working initially because I had some extra spaces here. And I guess that space was considered part of the chunk code chunk name. Um, and rather than giving me an error that says there is no chunk B, it just was not. Um, dealing with the dependency properly. Um, so that um, ca caching in our markdown, um, can can work can work um, really well. You don't have control over what it's saving inside that code chunk, and it may save a bunch more stuff than you want. Um, also, it the the stuff that's saved gets saved in a really complicated database thing that you can't really get into separately. Um, but you you can leave it to 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 R to keep track of what's saved and what 
when things need to get rerun. If there are dependencies between chunks, like any time the results of chunk A, if you know if the results of chunk A change, I need to re re rerun the re the chunk B. Um, you define those dependencies with this depends on, and in quotes give it the name of a previous chunk. And this bit could be um, a vector of character strings indicating multiple multiple previous code chunks that a given code chunk depends on. Our, um, Knitter also has this um, automatic detection of dependencies that basically is looking through the code for symbols. And um, if a symbol, you know, when a sim if a symbol is created or changed in one code chunk, it looks for that in its use in pre in subsequent code chunks and and automatically detects which chunks depend on which other ones. To use this, you do these um, two add these two lines to the top of your R Markdown document to set up the auto dependencies and to to you know run through and detect the dependencies. Um, you you do this and then all you have to do is the code the the code chunks that you want to cache you just get cache equals true and knitter should automatically detect which things depend on which other ones i've never used this and i guess i would i'm i would want to i i have I'm ambivalent about these automatic dependencies. On the one hand, it should, um, it could pick up on errors that you might make if you're if you're manually um, writing down which chunks depend on which other ones, and you could get them wrong. Um, this would this might be better than you um, if you're not really maintaining your code properly. On the other hand, I feel like. Um, I know better than any automatic thing, so maybe, and I want to make sure that the that it's right because I don't ever want to be printing a crappy, um, corrupted figure again. But it's you know worth trying. So that that was all about caching. So manually caching or. Um, caching with using using cache equals true in in our in a in a code chunk in our markdown um, and um, indicating how to set dependencies between them but f for jobs that are going to run a long period of time at some point you may want to make use of parallel computing um, and it if your computer has multiple processors and most of our laptops do now. They they have four or eight or sixteen even processors on them. Um, you want to make use of those multiple processors. I don't know much about multiple um, sort of parallel computing in Python, and I just barely know about parallel computing in R. The main way I do parallel computing in R is with this library Parallel. Um, that now is you know, distributed with R. Um, one function that it has that's really useful is this detect cores that will tell you how many CPU-like objects, how many CPU cores you have on your computer, of sort of how many simultaneous jobs you can run. On Macs and Unix, I mostly use this mcLapply function that is like the lapply function, but for multi-core. So it acts just like L apply, but then you also tell it at the end how many cores to use. So, um, and then it will it will run run those jobs, you know, using that many cores in parallel. And so if you have if you have a laptop that has eight CPUs, and you if you use MCL apply, it could get um, approaching eight times faster. Um, the, there's some overhead. There's considerable overhead in getting things started, but for 
for slow running jobs, you could get good speed up just on your laptop with this MCL apply function. If the, the computing that you're doing within um, in parallel uses random numbers in any way, you need to switch to the, the you need to switch the type of random number generation that you're using. So RNG kind, RNG stands for random number generation and kind stands for sort of the, you know, which algorithm for random number generation you're using. You need to switch to this thing. Um, some French um, statistical computing expert and his CMRG version of random number generation but this so this algorithm you works when you have kind of multiple streams of numbers random numbers you're trying to create mcl apply i find works really great um the main thing to worry about is memory usage um much of the time it relies on some shared memory so if you if you have a really big data object and you're doing analysis of different parts of it it will um, it, it will just keep that one main object and you start your eight streams running, doing calculations on different parts of it. Um, it will not make eight copies of that thing most of the time. Um, but with, when you're, if you're running eight processes on the same computer, um, you need to really worry about memory usage because if, if, if things get duplicated in space, you you quickly go from using you know a a gigabyte of RAM to you know twice as much RAM as you have on your laptop and um, you're not going to break anything but you're gonna you might have to um, you might have to do a hard reboot <laughs> if if things drag to a halt. This function I like really well. I'm but I'm sort of an old school L apply person so. Um, it, it's it's not much harder than using L apply. Um, in Windows, however, this thing doesn't this MCL apply doesn't work. There's a whole in Windows there's a whole separate way of doing of doing um, cluster computing on a on a given com, you know using the multiple CPUs. So on Windows, if you use this MCL apply, it just doesn't work at all. It may well it works, but it just uses one CPU. You need to instead use this cluster apply, but that requires that you first do this thing where you make a cluster object, then run cluster apply, and then afterwards stop the cluster. And for random number generation, you need to use this other function, cluster set RNG stream. So everything's a little more complicated on Windows. All these, these Windows functions actually do work in Unix. And so you could just use these latter functions and use them in Unix or Mac. Um, and then you'd have a solution that works all the time. But I find that the MCL apply is faster, does a better job of multiple, um, of memory and it's just, it works better. And it's less cumbersome in that you don't have to use this make cluster stop cluster and the cluster apply. Um, you just call this one function. But if the code that you're using could be run on either Unix or, or Windows, then you, you need to um, kind of be prepared to go with, with one or the other, depending on what's available. But for, for jobs that are going to take a year, um, nobody is really going to want to wait around for a year of computation. You're going to need to bring a lot of computers to bear. Um, this is probably not going to do it for you to take a, a year and cut a year into, you know, say you have a CPU, um, you say you have a computer with 32 cores, cutting it down to, you know, two weeks. Um, but it will take something that takes five minutes, it could potentially cut it down to be taking, you know, 20 seconds on a computer the, and um, without much more code and without having to, to worry about sort of reeling things. Um, can I chime in really quick? Yeah, of course. So 
on the Python side, Python actually has a built-in threading library, but you have to manage and create the threads yourself. So I don't know of anybody who really uses that, but there's a really good package called joblib. And joblib is kind of like the apply function you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Basically any for loop uh, that you would have, you could parallelize it using joblib and it's really simple. And uh, it just takes care of all the threading stuff under the under the hood. So I actually use that a lot. Like anytime I, I, like I have five data sets I'm working on right now, and I want to run the analysis on all five data sets, I always just throw in joblib because it'll make it five times faster and it does everything at the same time. And it's really easy to use. That's great. And you don't have to really change your code at all. Exactly. Exactly. That's neat. Thanks. Good to know. Um, I don't think that there's any way in R that you can get things running in parallel without a bit of work. Um, but if you, you start getting used to this and you could, um, kind of functions that you write that do these kinds of analyses, if you could build in some of these tools to make them, um, give them the option to run in parallel, you can, um, you know, set yourself up to make use of all the CPUs on your laptop and really um, get, and get things done, you know, four times faster um, or eight or 16 times faster, depending on what computing you have. But at some point, I think all of us end up going to some kind of distributed computing where the, the work that we're trying to get done cannot be done on any one computer that we need to make use of lots of computers. Here at Wisconsin, um, the, the place to go is this um, center for high throughput computing. And the software they use that it was you know, developed here at Madison is called HT Condor. So you, CHTC has tens of thousands of computers available and, um, and it's connected to this larger uh, nationwide system of computers that that you can potentially get access to. And so you can have your job, you can have a job that, you know, would take you five years get actually done within a week because you have 10,000 computers, um, your, your job getting run on 10,000 10, computers all at once. Um, you know, learning this HD Condor is you know, if you're here and you get access and you want to, if you have a job that's going to take a while, getting access to HD Condor and making use of it, I mean, getting access to CHTC and making use of HD Condor is, is really worthwhile for, for, you know, large scale work. And the crew at CHTC are really good at, um, well, they, I mean, they, they force you to meet with them so that they can really think about how your particular research project could be you know sort of best arranged to make use of the the um their resources and they'll they'll do a lot of work to help you to 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 do things right and to get i mean to get your work done a problem with this for for um for reproducibility is that you know, there are a lot of places that use HT Condor, but um, there are a lot of places that don't use HT Condor. There are a lot of Condor-like systems for distributing computing. Um, this is actually this is if you, if you look at the if you look at these slides separately, this is a link to a website that on Wikipedia I think that shows like a couple dozen different systems for distributing computing, for taking, you know, a set of jobs and sending them off to a set of computers and then collecting the results back afterwards. HD Condor is not the only um, tool for this. And mo many chances are high that you go to another job somewhere else, they're going to use a different computing system or that the person that wants to reproduce your analyses won't have HD Condor available. Um, And um, I, I've still for a long time just done my distribution, <laughs> distributed computing by hand with 
an old Perl script that I wrote and a template R script that where I have a Perl script that that replaces some template code within each R script with numbers one through 64 and then sends the 64 jobs off running on 64 different computers and brings them all back. Um, I don't, I shouldn't really recommend this, but I feel like I, I won't recommend this, but I feel like I should mention it because I, you know, I'm still kind of doing the by hand distributed computing. Um, but for those of you at Madison that want to take advantage of high throughput computing, HD Condor and the HCHTC are the things to work to use, but be prepared that you move on to some other job somewhere else that they probably have a different system. It's probably not that different. It's not like, I mean, it's like once you learn one language for distributing jobs, it's just a matter of translating that to another one. But um, it, it, taking some code for HT Condor and rewriting it to use XGrid um, would, is, it, you know, it requires effort. Computer simulations, I think, are, you know, another s special situation for um, reproducibility and for big jobs. That computer simulations always require these seeds for your random number generator. In R, it's this, it's, they're stored in this single object dot random dot seed. And you need to make sure that multiple parallel jobs get different seeds. Um, if, um, if you, in many cases, if you don't give it a seed, it generates a seed from the clock. Um, you don't want to rely on the current, oops. You don't want to rely on the current seed and you don't want to rely on it being generated from the clock because um, if, you, if you run, if, if you run um, 100, per, um, simulations in parallel, if they, if they read the same seed, each of them, they'll give you, you'll, you'll use a hundred CPUs doing exactly the same thing, giving you exactly the same re results just a hundred times, which is not what you intend. And if you, if you're relying on seeds that are generated from the clock, then, um, jobs running jobs that get started at exactly the same time will get exactly the same seed and they'll end up um, giving you the same results and you'll, um, and it's somewhat unpredictable what will happen. But another neat, another reason to not rely on the current seed or having it from the clock is that if you want to reproduce these results exactly, it would be good to save the seed that you used so that you can rerun exactly the same thing. So what I tend to do in our, um, there's a, a function set seed that you give it a large number and it um, then specifies this random number seed. And if I'm running um, 100 different replicates of a simulation, I will give that, I will give it a seed that it's some large number plus one, two, three, up to 100. So they'll, they'll each get um, a different seed. And I say an alternative is to create a big batch of simulated data sets in advance, simulate all the data in advance, and then distribute it that to the to the the hundred different um, jobs. And I think you know for you know with CHTC and the and the Condor system, probably this is a good way to go of simulate your data in advance and then send those off to the different. Um, to you know, eat one each to a different job. But you know, th this thing take if means that you're you're sending less data over the internet. I guess you could just have to collect the results back. But um, the point here is is when you're doing simulations, you need to make sure that the different simulations. Um, different results. 
I mean, get different random number seeds so that you're not doing the same thing a bunch of times. And um, the way that I do it is with this set seed with a large number plus one through whatever the number of jobs that I start running. Um, and I'll typically just like, you know, draw a large number at random and that'll be my first seed or I'll use today's date like um, 2020-04-09 and make that my seed for the day. And with these computer simulations, I would say, and with computer simulations and with just big jobs in distributed computing, I would have a subdirectory of your project devoted to that big job that you're running and save all the seeds, save all the inputs, save all the outputs, um, keep track of the numbers that are running within each of those jobs, save the raw results, and then have a script that combines the thousand different jobs results into one thing and save those combined results. And, you know, if, if disk space is not at a premium, I would just save everything here, save it all. If this space is at a premium, then I would I would maybe skip the raw results and just save the combined ones. And and of course have some readme that describes what you're doing in that subdirectory and what it all is about. But if you if you need to go back and rerun things, it's it would be nice if you had all those um, thousand input files collected together and saved. Um, and if there's a question about what, why the results are different. It, it can be good to, to have the version numbers that were used in each of those um, jobs, because sometimes that could be the problem that you're running, you're, you're running with different libraries in different situations uh, on different computers, maybe, because different computers that you're using are using different versions of R or Python or the libraries. And my, so my approach has been to have a separate directory for each big batch of, of computations that I'm doing and a make file that controls really the combination of those main batches into um, a combined data set that represents all the results from that big job and that the um, an R markdown document that that brings those combined results in and uses them in some way. So really thinking, making this, making the work modular for every sort of every, every task where I think, oh, I better go to Condor and run this. Well, there's a subdirectory that governs that task. And um, the, that collects, you know, the thousand results from a thousand different computers and an R script that does the combination of those, and an overall make file that that um, points to, you know, where that subdirectory is and where the thousand little pieces are, and that um, brings them all together into one R Markdown document that describes the full analysis. But it, the main problem, the main problems, question. Yeah, Carl, I, I was just wondering, if you, you can finish your, your bit here, but I, I was, I guess I use Condor a lot, and I've always wondered, like, what the use and availability of that technology is outside of UW-Madison, and how that affects the reproducibility of any research that uses it. I, I would say that there are a lot of, there are a lot of companies, there are a lot of universities that use HD Condor, um, but it's, you know, not universal. And so um, you got to expect that the it's more likely than not that the person that's interested in reproducing your work, which could be you having moved on to a new university, won't really have access to HD Condor and that kind of system. Um, and that and that's why it's especially important to um, to document this input and output, and um, 
if you provide if you provide a thousand inputs um someone could potentially you know take your the you know the the condor um sort of script and convert it to their system and run your thousand inputs using using their system um but it, it's not it's it's I think more likely than not that someone trying to reproduce your hefty results are going to have to do a little bit of work to um, rerun those intermediate calculations. But, right. but also, yeah. Yeah. I, I actually was like just yesterday asked to, um, I had run something on Condor and I was asked to like provide like a, a usage just to use on like the command line, like to do the same thing that, and it, it took a, you know, it took a minute. You, you have to really like read through, even if you know exactly what you're doing um, and just kind of manually, like, you know, there's no, there's no line in that, you know, Condor submit file. That's like, Oh, well, this is what you would do, you know, outside of Condor. Um, yeah. I mean, that's my experience too. But it be it could be that the person trying to reproduce the results is willing to just trust you on those big you know large scale batch computations, that you provide them with you know those subdirectories and the results of those, and they're really only interested in this sort of higher level thing. You ha they have all those intermediate results, and they're just gonna take those as truth and and um, look at the the higher level part. And you know if they really care, they could dig in think you know condor with r at some point you have a whole bunch of you know a, a, a separate script for each job and you're you know something that combines them together afterwards so that part you should be able to um kind of redo in a different system or at the command line The, the most common problems that I have in um, these distributed jobs is forgetting to put save at the end of my distributed jobs so that I run, you know, the equivalent of a year's worth of computation and then I, but I don't actually save anything. And so all my work is lost and it's just like, I just heated up the world or the, you know, the worst thing is I, I remembered the save command, but I had some kind of syntax error inside the save command. Um, you know, I forgot a double quote. You, it's hard to it's hard to test these things, and you, you do that, and you you know do the same thing. You run a thousand jobs, heat up the world, and all the jobs start dying as soon as they're finished. Um, but by that point, it's too late. Um, so you you might want to you know run one job on your local computer and make sure that there's not a syntax error in the code that you're using. Cause I do this all the time of just waste a bunch of computing resources on um, with, with a bug just in the most lame part of the code. Another problem that I have is that, you know, I have this big thing set up to use make and make decides it needs to rerun th something when I know that it doesn't need to rerun it, but in doing, and in doing so it clobbers over some important results that, you know, cleans out stuff that I calculated carefully. Um, two solutions to this. One is don't let scripts overwrite output files. Um, a, if, if the output file is there, a script should just give an error and stop immediately. Um, and you should make sure that, that those scripts only will start running and writing over an output file if the output file doesn't all exist. And secondly, save backups of like you ran a thousand jobs on Condor, save backups of all that data so that um, you don't lose it. Although, you know, sometimes you, you, you need to, you just don't have the disk space available. So you have to distrib stuff and save just the combined results, say. So 
um, reproducibility of big jobs is, I think, inherently more difficult than reproducibility of a, you know, something that you could just run on your laptop. That it requires the same kind of organization that you of any reproduce, you know, ensuring that any analysis is reproducible. Um, but I, I think you have to be yet more careful about modularizing of taking, you know, parts of the analysis that are that are intensive computationally and separating them out um, and have the the points of um, dependency between those different modules be as limited as possible. So and and be as as obvious as possible, you know, so if something some early part of the say data cleaning gets changed that it's clear which pieces need to get rerun. Um, you know, save everything, save all the inputs and outputs and document everything and make sure that the documentation matches what um, it actually the the documentation matches its the current state of the project and not some old state of the project. And finally, um, you know, there are a lot of new skills to learn for um, distributed computing for parallel computing. I think those can really pay off in the short term if we all switch to um, Python and use at just import job lib into our um, Python scripts, we can make better use of our laptops. But um, I, in our things are definitely more cumbersome, but making, you know, really heating up your laptop and making use of all the CPUs on your computer all at once is um, re really rewarding in a way. It's great to see those little CPU bars go, all of them light up all the way to the top. Um, and, you know, the CHTC and Condor or, you know, other sort of, you know, large scale distributed computing make um, analyses available to you that you never would have, that you couldn't do otherwise, that you just, there's so much that you could do with a, with a thousand computers. Um, so, um, you know, worth putting some effort in to, to learn to make use of those resources.